also from our side, welcome Prun. Uh, it's very nice to have uh, an artist here who knows uh, the clinic, uh, who knows uh, fasting, who we know also as a person. And uh, we're very happy to have the, uh, the terracotta daughter now to uh, be with us for the whole time and to give our garden uh, what I feel a totally different uh, atmosphere. And uh, I have the uh, pleasure to have a little introduction and to get to know Prun a little bit better and to get to know also the work uh, of art that she has uh, chosen to give us, but also the work of art that she uh, does throughout her life. Um, art uh, that is closely uh, connected also to her personal life and um, that she uh, sculpts and does um, since a long time. But I want to start this first question um, by telling you a little quote um, that she wrote me into my book uh, of her art that I read and I, I loved uh, very much. And, and she wrote, Art is for the day what dreams are for the night. They keep us sane. So I'd like to ask you for a starter uh, what uh, this means to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so again, thank you for the one who are joining us. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I've been here since three weeks now, uh, 21 days, time for the cells. <laughs> and, um, and it's the third time I'm coming right now. And I'm so happy, you know, to to be here, to join uh, also the, the history and the family of Bohinga. And this little quote, Leo, that I wrote in the book, in fact, is for me this idea that when you go to sleep at night, you have that very important phase of uh, dreaming that remakes into your mind a kind of order it uh, recreates what you, you, you're reviving, recreating what you've been through during the day, during the month, during your life. And it's uh, something that in a way brings our brain mm. to stay sane, uh, to digest everything we've been through. And to me, art, some people could say, you know, it's unuseful. Why would we... we would, we, would we need art also when there is something uh, in a country in crisis that you would shut down the first? It would be the cultural minister, for example, um, where in fact uh, I truly believe that art, not only for the artists, but also uh, for everyone who interacts with a, a, an artwork that has been made uh, with the art and the soul of the artist, um, makes a kind of harmony or a kind of order or a kind of, of sanity uh, into your mind. So for me, art are like dreams. They are here to, you know, keep us sane. Sane. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we um, like to um, emphasize that we try to inspire people here. So I think um, a lot of people hopefully get inspired here. Um, so... Um, Fasting and inspiration um, go together very well, and I think this is uh, something that your uh, sculpture will also um, help people uh, to get inspired. But let's talk a little bit about the sculpture that we can admire now here in the garden. For those of you who haven't um, had the chance to see the wonderful um, documentary, Serendipity, uh, which documents um, a lot about um, the artwork. So maybe you can uh, talk a little bit about the sculpture that we have here yeah. now. The Absolutely. So yesterday we projected uh, my movie, which uh, I made uh, two years ago. Um, and into that movie, you can see some images that I've never really shown before. Uh, this is the moment where I buried an army of sculptures in China in a secret site. I cannot tell you even tonight if we are between us where it is exactly. We will know in 2030 when I will uh, get back there and excavate with archaeologists this army. What I called my army, it's uh, 108 sculptures, life-size, um, 
of little girls, the terracotta daughters, I call them. They are inspired by the terracotta soldiers, the, the very well-known Xi'an uh, army of soldiers that was made 2,000 years ago uh, by the Qin emperor, the same one who did the, the big wall. He had a crazy life. And um, about 10 years ago, I decided to go to China and work with sociologists, Chinese sociologists, um, on a very important subject that I, you know, I was really feeling um, I had to do something about it. It's um, what they call into sociology sex selection, uh, sex imbalance. It means that since the 80s, uh, we are using technologies such as scans, ultrasounds, to select the baby girl before they are born and we abort them. And it's uh, something that we don't really hear about, we don't really talk about, but it creates a huge imbalance because uh, obviously it happens uh, mainly in Asia, in China and India, which is one third of the world's population. So when you are talking about imbalance in those countries, it's huge imbalance. It doesn't only happen in Asia, it happens also in uh, some countries, even in Europe, in Armenia, for example. Um, but that imbalance is a subject um, that is um, worked on by sociologists around the world. I've met a lot of them. Uh, I've met some in uh, India years ago, before to do my project in China. And I've been working on a, on a subject called the Holy Daughters. It was a hybrid between the Holy Cow and the Daughter. Um, because there is that huge paradox where in uh, India they would worship the cow as holy because it uh, represents the symbol of fertility. But no one wants to have a daughter who is vector of fertility because she would be a mother one day. So I decided to create hybrids between the cow, the holy cow, and the little girl, uh, life-size. And I brought those sculptures to New Delhi, and I abandoned them in the streets. And I don't know where they are now, but I was filming, documenting the reactions of the people. Like if I was a journalist or a sociologist, I was asking them the questions. They didn't know I did it. And I got incredible reactions on my work. And after that, uh, one year after, I, it was the, the moment where every 10 years they calculate the imbalance between boys and, and girls. And everyone thought, because it, it's been since the 70s, that they realized there were that huge imbalance. So everyone thought it would be better. And in fact, since 70, 80, 90, etc., the worst, worst, worst results were that exact year, 2011, where, when I did the, the project. So I decided to go back to Kolkata and to create a, a new version of that sculpture, but a, a giant one uh, that we uh, performed through the streets. We came into a festival that is called Durga Puja, and I made it following the codes of the family. You know, I did it with the family from, uh, from Kolkata, with the craftsmen as a collaboration. And we went into the street until the Ganges River and we pushed it back and it disappeared. Um, it was made in clay of the river, it went back to the river. And uh, two years after that, not even, one year after that, not even, six months after that, I was in China <laughs> uh, to start that project that this sculpture is part of. And my first move was to go to meet the sociologists and to tell them, do you think a project like that would be needed in China? They said yes, they had heard about my project in India and they wanted me to do one in, in China. But I had nothing, and you know one, I had to first find the craftsmen to work with, find the little girls to work with, uh, and the crazy thing that I saw like a star sign was that the sociologists were in the same city than the army, than the craftsmen, and the girls were not that far. So everything was kind of, China is huge, and everything was kind of falling together. So I saw that like a sign and I started the craziest project of my life. Because what I didn't know at the time is that uh, it would take me about, yeah, 20 years. Um, and I'm just not even at, at seven right now. Um, 
that it would uh, also be half a million of my own pocket, but that's, you know, detail. Uh, that uh, it would be thousands of trips to China in every month. I was traveling from New York, where I live, to China, back to New York, back to China, back to New York, back to China. I think uh, that's what got me, uh, you know, here. Like suddenly, a few years after, I had to take care of my health because I didn't for a few years. And that army that I created, I created it with um, beautiful craftsmen, with incredible uh, girls also. Um, I can tell you more about it later. And, uh, and that sculpture that you've seen here is part of that project, which is very important to me. In the process of inspiration, uh, did um, how does your inspirational process work do you work alone do you and uh, then what uh, how do you work with fasting in that in that sense so maybe some of you also uh, need to get inspired uh, i always uh, i'm always interested in how this works um, as an artist you don't know and you don't want to know from where inspiration is coming from because there is something magic about it and things magical you shouldn't explain them <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, but if if if, uh, if an artwork is uh, based in such a personal uh, experience, um, it's something that you. It's it's also kind of a delivery in the end. If you produce an art with this history, with this experience, um, so um, how do you, as an artist, want people to um, interact with this art piece? So, because we will have a lot of people here who will stand here and who will. Um, ask us the history and uh, is this something where you are still taking part in if you like to stand near your sculpture and never never what i want is people to to teach me things on my artwork okay so i think you you learn even more from the people who are looking at your artwork than you know you you want to know sometimes some people don't want to know anything about an artwork and i respect mm -hmm. that because they want to create their own story. And I think it's far more strong when someone appropriates the artworks to himself. Because in a way, once you've done the artwork, it, it's not yours anymore. It's for the people to look at it and to project from their own story, their own education, their own frame of reference. They're going to see something very different and sometimes something you haven't seen as an artist. So to me, that's fascinating what I can learn about an artwork from the eyes of someone else. Mm -hmm. And then if they want to know anything about it, I'm here, but I wouldn't impose. Okay. Um, is this, um, we always find it very hard for us to, um, when we have, uh, the, when we want to portray fasting, it's always difficult. How do you portray uh, something like fasting because you cannot show uh, and it's also always very, uh, very personal. Um, the portraying of uh, this experience of fasting, it's very um, individual, it's very a subjective um, experience. But uh, um, it's for you now, it's also the, the regaining of health in, 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 in all of its aspects, even by uh, becoming uh, a mother. So it's also the change in, in the responsibility and now also in your family but uh, for you as a person with this experience fasting uh, what does it mean for you does it, do you have a like a different relationship now uh, than before and um, uh, how would you describe this for you i think not only it's different for every person but it's all, also different every year mm -hmm. each time you come you have a different relation to, to fasting and that's what is great here is that you can think ahead, decide here with the doctors what should be good for this specific year and then along the way you change according to how you feel, according to what your body feels. Last year, for example, I had a big show opening in September. I was here in July and I had uh, two sculptures in wood, large sculptures to sculpt here. So kindly uh, uh, you helped me to find a studio and I was walking every day to my studio, working on wood, sculpting on wood while fasting. And this year, you know, it was a total different story. So that's what I like is the fact of you never know what you're going to go through. And every day are different. The only thing is, it's, the important thing is that it's a choice. When you come, it's a choice. 
it's a kind of contract between yourself, your soul and your body. And it's also um, a ritual. The fact of coming back to me, it's a ritual with my health where I know that once a year, uh, of course, we shouldn't wait one year before to take care of our body. But once a year, I know that I, I get back to to zero. Remettre les compteurs à zéro, like. Yeah. Mm, uh, of null stellen, yeah. But. Yeah. So it's that idea, you know, yeah. to to bring back everything on level zero to to start back again. It's interesting because uh, rituals also play a big part uh, in your in your shows, also in your like the ritual that you described in India. And uh, so it's a kind of continuation of a ritual, if you like. Huh? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. I um, uh, I would like to open the questions now uh, also to you. Um, maybe you would like I have to. One question. Uh, yes. Because you are leaving tomorrow, I didn't ask this question. Uh, first, you said it's the one girl. You you said it's Yindi, and. First, why did you choose this one for us? And then, how came the idea of taking only the head? Because you could have put the whole girl there. So the Yindi, she's one of the eight uh, originals. She's the oldest, the eldest of, uh, of the eight. When I met her, she was about uh, 14, I believe. So she's now 20. And uh, she wanted at some point to do medicine, medicine to, to, to be a doctor. Finally, she went to engineer, but uh, she's a um, you know, very smart person coming from a, a small, small village uh, of, of the deep countryside of China. And now she's in a big university. So, yeah, she's a, a real example of uh, assertivity, you know, of, of, of working on, on yourself and, and going further. And um, this is the first time I'm doing such a sculpture in such a material. This sculpture is, um, she has a, 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 a sister called Hao Ping. So I have that, that big head also uh, as an, another little girl called Hao Ping. But for Yindi, uh, this is the number one that we made for the first time in a very specific material. I'm trying, and, and, and this is why I might have to come back and redo the patina sometimes, because this is, this is number one. So really, we, we, we are testing it on you. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> because it's a beautiful material that I've been uh, making with my team uh, research on since uh, about a year. Uh, it's uh, concrete, but that we try to do as uh, natural as possible. So it's 40% of earth, of clay, 40% of recycled sand from, from, con from concrete, recycled, and only 20% of cement. So we try to do something as clean as possible, but that can stay outside and, and that, that has the, the, the tenacity of a sculpture. So... Um, yeah, for me, it's it's very special to 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 try that material that tries to be you know as uh, as natural as possible in a place like here, and um, and also um, that little girl Yindi who is very 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 special to me. And why only the head and not oh, the hand? Only the the head is because you know the the sculpture that are the the full sculptures. Um, I, I've done the, the, the full sculptures and I've done the, the big head, a version of the, of the sculpture as a big head. Um, also because I was um, getting inspired by, by things that had been done in China around the, the army. And they have done uh, sculptures in terracotta, they have done sculptures in bronze. So I had done sculptures in terracotta, I have done sculptures in bronze. And for, um, it's very specific there. You, when you see the sculptures, the, the whole sculpture together, the, the whole girl together, I mean, or the whole, whole soldiers together, you think it's one piece where, in fact, the head, you can take it off. And as a sculptor, I was fascinated with that because it was a total different process to make and to sculpt and to understand how the tradition was to, to make it. So I had to become a craftsman uh, and understand the craftsman techniques to, to do this. And once I had finished the whole body, I, uh, you know, at some point I put the heads to work on them on the table and I found them so beautiful by themselves without the body that I thought, okay, I will, 
um, also uh, create, get inspired from that and make a, a series out of it. So that's how I, I came to do the head. It's crazy, but all, you know, it's, it's like a game for kids. You can take off the head and put it on the side and the soldiers are made, made that way. Thank so, you, everyone. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much. And now we can all go to the uh, to Yindi. Say hello. <laughs> Thank you.